Hey guys, welcome to another revision video on IGCSE Chemistry. Today we're going to be covering the fundamentals of chemical reactions. So without further ado, we'll begin. So the first thing you have to understand is the differences between a chemical change and a physical change. A physical change relates to the changes in the physical states of matter, for example, ice turning into water, and uh, a chemical change occurs more at a molecular level when two or more molecules interact with one another. Taking a look at chemical reactions in a bit more detail, we need to think about the collision theory, which states that two conditions have to be met for a chemical reaction to occur, one of which being two or more particles must collide, the other being that the particles, when they do collide, have to have sufficient energy in order for the reaction to occur. So, in other words, when two particles collide but they don't have enough energy, then no, the reaction won't occur, um, and oppositely, when they even if they have enough energy when they don't collide, then of course, then that's just not going to work either. So these two conditions have to be met. And this is actually quite important when we take a look at the rate of a chemical reaction because a lot of conditions like temperature, pressure, and all that sort of stuff actually affect things like collision rates of particles and you know the, the energy levels and therefore affecting how quickly the reaction happens, or in other words, the rate of a chemical reaction. So this is exactly what we're going to be looking at now. The, so there's a couple of things. The concentration is basically how many particles there are in a given volume, right? So a higher concentration suggests that there are more particles that are closer to each other, so therefore, by chance alone, the rate of collision will be higher, and that means the rate of a chemical reaction will thus be increased as well. Pressure works exactly the same way, um, except that it's you know it's only related to gases only. So a high pressure actually suggests that there are more particles um, in a given space, and therefore again the collision rate will be higher, and uh, therefore increasing the rate of a chemical reaction. Um, the temperature, ignore the word size, sorry, the temperature, if you think about it, a higher temperature will actually mean that the particles, the individual particles have more energy, but not only that, because they're traveling at a higher speed, the collision rate will also be higher as well. So both factors will be elevated, therefore increasing the rate of a chemical reaction as well. Uh, when we look at particle size, we're really only referring to solids, and it suggests that a smaller particle size actually has a lot larger surface area for collisions to happen, and therefore uh, achieving a higher rate of chemical reaction. So I've sort of diagrammatically represented that here. If you can see that the red particles are trying to decompose the the blue this blue block of solid into its individual you know particles, I suppose. Um, You've got two options. This big block, you can see that it's actually quite inconvenient for the red ones to act on uh, because it cannot access the middle atoms because it's sort of surrounded by other uh, blue particles. Whereas if you were to separate the blue particles into separate pieces, you've got a lot more area. Well, the red particles have a lot more area to work on now to decompose uh, this the solid, and therefore um, the the rate of chemical reaction will be a lot higher. Now, when we take a look at the at something called catalysts, uh, so these are substances that basically don't get used in the chemical reaction, but are there to increase the rate and. Um, a bile enzymes are found in our bodies, and that's an example of a biological catalyst. So let's take a look at uh, the concept of reversible reaction. So this is when reactants form products. So this is meant to be reactants, sorry, and the products actually react uh, to form back the reactants. For example, A gives B to give A sorry A plus B gives C but C reacts back to, or decomposes back to give A and B. So in other words, we can sort of uh, exemplify the reaction like so, with this double-headed arrow. So at some point in a reversal reaction, what will happen is the rate of the forward reaction will actually begin to equal exactly the rate of the reverse reaction. So this means that C is being formed at the same rate as A and B is being formed, because A and B make C, but C is forming A and B at exactly the same rate. What that means, therefore, is that the concentrations of all three of these things, i.e. the reactants and the products, will all remain constant, and when this happens, this is called an equilibrium. So the concentrations of these individual you know, reactants and products in an equilibrium is called the position of equilibrium, and we'll talk about that in a bit more detail now. 
so let's put that up here again so the position of equilibrium can actually shift okay depending on how we alter the conditions of the environment so when we talk about a shift if we talk about it being a shift to the right it suggests that more of a and b is getting used to make c uh, this means that the equilibrium concentrations of a and b will decrease whereas the, uh, the equilibrium concentration of c will actually increase oppositely when we talk about a shift to the left it's uh it's suggesting that more C is getting broken down to make A and B, so therefore the concentration of product C goes down, whereas the concentrations of A and B will um, inevitably elevate. So depending on the change in you know conditions, the equilibrium can either shift to the right or to the left, and we're going to be looking at that in a bit more detail in this slide. So for the sake of you know the argument, we're going to say that A plus B gives C again. Um, I've added some extra information. We'll say that the forward reaction is exothermic, whereas the reverse reaction is endothermic, and this is important. You'll you'll see why later. But what's what's really 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 important to understand here is that the position of equilibrium will always 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 shift. Uh, in the direction to oppose the change being imposed. So, you know, you'll understand what this means as we go through each of these examples. For example, concentration, when we increase the product concentration, right? For example, if we increase the concentration of product C, that will shift the equilibrium to the left because what? So remember, um, we, if we increase the concentration of C, the equilibrium will try and oppose that change to reduce the concentration. And the way that it can do that is shift the equilibrium to the left by producing more A and B from C, therefore decreasing concentration of C. Exactly the same thing if we were to forcefully decrease the concentration of C um, and manipulate the environment that way, then the equilibrium will actually shift to the right uh, as if to make more C. Uh, so uh, I hope that makes sense and a uh, similar thing if we were to increase the reactant concentration for example the concentration of A uh, you would assume that the equilibrium will actually shift to the right in order to remove or reduce the concentration of A because we just increased it and wants to oppose that change and decrease it um, so that's sort of how this whole thing works um, when we talk about the temperature, exactly the same thing. That's why I gave you this extra information above. If we were to increase the temperature, what the you know what the reaction will do will try to you know decrease the temperature. So so therefore it will favor the endothermic reaction, which means that the reaction is taking in heat. Um, so it will shift in this example. It will shift the equilibrium to the left. Uh, if we were to decrease the temperature, it will actually favor the exothermic reaction because it's going to try to increase the temperature, and uh, you know by up, it's obviously opposing what we're doing. So um, it'll shift the equilibri equilibrium to the right if we were to uh, do that. Um, now, when we talk about pressure, um, I want you to take a look at this diagram to the right here because it's actually quite important. Pressure can be pressure can be basically defined uh, by the the individual gas molecules um, hitting against the walls of the container in which it's in. So, if you have more particles in this given space, then there'll be more collisions with the wall, uh, and therefore the pressure will be higher. If you've got a smaller amount of particles then there will be less particles hitting the walls and therefore less pressure. So pressure really um, only is to do with gases, right? So a high pressure suggests that there is a lot uh, more particles in that given space compared to you know, lower pressures. So if we were to increase the pressure again, the equilibrium will shift to the side or it will shift towards trying to decrease the pressure and the way it can do that is to favor the side that has lower number of particles. If you look at it here, the left, left hand side in this example has two particles but the right hand side only has one. So therefore, it will actually shift the equilibrium to the right in this instance towards the side with a lower amount of particles because that gives lower pressures. Um, if you were to decrease the pressure, it will be the opposite. It will try to increase the pressure and the way that it can do that is shift the equilibrium position towards the side that has more particles because more particles means more particles hitting against the walls of the container I suppose theoretically and that gives rise to higher pressures so in this case decreasing the pressure will shift the equilibrium uh, position to the left 
and a catalyst actually doesn't affect the equilibrium at all so don't get tricked by this in an exam it it was only there just to increase the rate of reaction and it increases the speed of both the forward and the reverse reaction. It doesn't affect the position. So lastly, we're going to be looking at the concept of redox. Uh, it's shortened for reduction in oxidation and this can be demonstrated in two different ways and both are absolutely correct. One is the oxygen gain or loss, right? Oxygen, ox ox sorry, oxidation is the gain of oxygen whereas reduction is the loss of oxygen. So in this example to the right here, copper oxide can be uh, you can say that it's been reduced because it goes from copper oxide to copper, therefore it's lost in oxygen. But if you think about it, hydrogen on the other hand um, has gained oxygen, so therefore it's uh, you can say that the hydrogen has been oxidized. Another way of looking at uh, redox is the electron gain or loss. So oxidation is defined as the loss of electrons and reduction is the gain of electrons. So if you look at this example here, magnesium uh, added to chlorine giving magnesium chloride, you can see that there's no absolutely no oxygen involved, uh, but there certainly is some sort of electron transfer. So what we're going to be looking at is how magnesium, right, the, the atom has evolved or changed itself into the ionic form in this ionic structure of magnesium chloride. So if you take a look at it separately, magnesium has actually lost two electrons uh, and to, to form the magnesium cation and therefore because it's lost electrons it's said to have been oxidized whereas chlorine uh, on the other hand the molecule has gained electrons to become the iron uh, therefore it's an example of reduction because it's again gained electrons. So I hope, you, uh, hope you guys found that helpful. Please uh, visit my website www.freeexamacademy.com for uh, more detailed notes and guide on the topic. Otherwise, please like, share and subscribe. And I know that it's fairly close to exams. And also, if you have any further questions, just comment and I will try to answer. Thanks and I'll see you in the next video.